We've left Tarakan. Last two podcasts were from Tarakan. Did you know that? Oh, did I know that? Yes, I am fully aware that we are now in a proper atoll. Yes. What's it called? It's called, uh, I just told you and I've forgotten already. It's the it's Maratua. Maratua, that's right. So this is, if you look on a chart or a map, this is a very strange horseshoe shaped atoll and it's well off the land as well. It is literally uh, right, no, it's not in the middle of the Celebes Sea, but it's, it's out there, isn't it? It certainly is. Uh, it's part of the Derawan archipelago. And we have already stayed at Derawan in between the last podcast and this podcast, which is a fabulous island. And we will be showing everybody all about that when we do our vlogs in a few weeks' time. So this is Maratua. We arrived here yesterday. Today is Tuesday, the 22nd of March. Yes, you say you arrived. we arrived here yesterday. We only just arrived here yesterday. Wasn't easy, was it? It was the toughest bit of helming I think I've ever done. And we won't talk any more about it because we'll, we'll perhaps cover this off in a vlog. But uh, boy, that was that last hour was tough. We were going backwards. <laughs> we were. We were actually going backwards on the track, weren't we? But yep. yes, as you say, we won't talk about it now because that's that's to come in a, in a future proper vlog. Uh, so, but the point is that here we are now. We're inside a nice safe atoll. There is weather around us. We've had a few storms this morning, well, squalls this morning, a bit of rain, a bit of sun, looking good at the moment. So we thought it was about time we started this podcast, isn't it? It goes yes. out on Thursday, recorded today. Hello, I'm Liz. And I'm Jamie. Welcome to Follow the Boat, in which we discuss what it's really like to give it all up to live on a boat. And go travelling around the world. We've been doing it since 2006 and we're still at it. Each week we talk about our latest YouTube video. And about boats, sailing, travel or anything else which floats into our heads. And if you leave a comment we like, we'll give you an answer and a name check. Peace, Peace and, and fair, fair winds. winds. We've got a couple of things to talk about. I think what we should do really is we should start by talking about the last episode that went up. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't write the number down. I think it's 294, is that right? It is 294. Now, last week you said 294, and we were actually mm. referring to 293. Right. We do very occasionally make these mistakes, yeah, but uh, a lot. Um, always check the description for the, the truth. But yes, it was 294, and it was all about the moment we discovered the broken U bolt on Esper. Yes, it was. And it was. Yeah, it was a little bit scary spot in that because we were actually 10 metres from pulling the anchor over the bow. So we, we were already leaving. And it was only when I glanced over to see one of the deck fittings had, had popped out. Uh, so we dropped the hook and of course we had to take the head, headboards down in the galley to have a look. And the bolt literally just came away in my hand. So if you haven't seen episode 294, have a look at it because uh, what we're going to talk about now will refer to that and you'll see in detail what actually happened. The whole episode really is about this very dangerous position that we were in and how you resolved it at the time. So do you want to talk through, I mean, we've had a lot of comments, a lot of comments, advice, general appraisals of, of what went on. And I think you've, you've noted down a few that you wanted to talk through. Yes, well, first of all, I should just apologize for the cinematography in that episode because it was all done on my phone. Mm. It was all done at the last minute. Ian of Icy Red very kindly offered to come ashore with me. So I literally just dropped the dinghy in the water and went ashore and didn't think about vlogging. And this tends to happen quite often when we're in a moment of crises. We're so preoccupied with, you know, resolving the issue that we don't think about videoing it. So all no. done on the phone. So it was a little bit shaky, but I think it added to the atmosphere, didn't it? Yes, I suppose it did. But for someone who is such a perfectionist, I was surprised you didn't take the camera with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, uh, that just as an aside, the point about when the really big pieces of shit hit the fan, <laughs> we often don't have our cameras with us. So we have to explain later what happened. And this mm. was one of those. Well, yesterday was a good example yeah, yeah. because yeah. we we won't give the game away too much. But I kept I kept saying to you, grab the camera, grab the camera, and you said, no, 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 we've got other things to do, and you uh, and so we only got a little bit of footage. But yes, it does happen anyway. I think we did cover off quite nicely how we resolved the situation under the circumstances. But I think you need to explain in in more detail what happened to those that are listening and didn't see it. Okay, so this is one of the deck fittings. It goes through the deck, so it's bolted from underneath, and it holds up the mizzen mast. 
Now, at this point, I should say a couple of people said I'm not particularly happy with these uh, U-bolts. Um, I think Luke said, I cringe every time I see U-bolts of any kind used in standing rigging. And I think uh, so Sailing Salty Lass also commented on the fact that their, theirs seem to be a lot more robust. Bear in mind, this is the mizzen mast. This is not the main mast. So the main mast does have its own dedicated chain plates. And I guess the designers just decided that the U-bolts were enough. Bearing in mind, we've got seven points at which the mizzen mast is held up. Yes, I think that that wasn't explained in the video. So although it looked terrifying, we are massively over-rigged mm. on this catch. So we can lose quite a bit of rigging and still have more than many other boats. This is very true. I mean, yeah. when you look around us and especially, you know, you look at like a catamaran, for example, mm. it literally has three or four points at which the mast is held up. The fact we have seven just for the mizzen mm. alone, I think says a lot about, as you say, the, uh, the over-rigging nature of this. Yeah. So uh, anyway, um, so one of these popped out. Yeah. And of course, you say, well, it's hardly likely to fall down. But even so, it's not something that you should no. ignore. Uh, a number of people commented on the fact, well, if that one's gone, then what about the others? That was exactly our thought at the time. Yeah. So uh, Windmill965, uh, who I think is Jerome from Penang, hello. How about the other rigging bolts? I would guess if one got rusted, the others wouldn't be far behind. And Kenneth Watson said, seems a good notice to replace all the through deck fasteners. And... It's a fair point. Now, something I didn't mention in the video was that this particular bolt, I think, was the one bolt we replaced when we very first bought the boat. And it was made out of 304, not 316. Really? You didn't tell me that? Yeah. And I, I remember... That was Joe, in, in Turkey? In Turkey, yes. I remember having the conversation with Jody, the uh, marina manager, almost apologising, saying, you're going to have to do with 304. And I know it's on the port side, and I think it was that particular fitting. So this could be one explanation. Uh, we took up another deck fitting thinking we could just swap them over. So I had already looked at another two deck fittings on the same side, and, and they're fine. They're okay. In an ideal world, yes, we should stop what we're doing and inspect everything. But of course, don't forget, we are running out of time at this point. We're halfway down the east coast of Malaysia. We have only uh, a few days left before our visa runs out. And uh, that, unfortunately, was the circumstances we were having to contend with. We weren't in a position to take down every single headboard, strip apart Esper and inspect every single uh, deck fitting. I want to stop you there. Uh, because most people will tell you that safety is more important than deadlines. Mm -hmm. so that's the natural response to that. Mm -hmm. And um, I think what you're suggesting is that you know that we took the decision that the deadline was more important than the safety but I think you have to put the two together so there's always risk analysis in everything we do in sailing every day deciding what we'll do where we'll go whatever and the risk analysis at that stage was as you said you didn't think that the rest had gone you didn't uh, think yes at a, at a glance yes, yes. Um, we thought that the risk was worth it but we were going from then on to sail even more defensively than we normally would. So to put the minimum amount of strain. Yes. Is that right? Yes, I, I mean, yes, unfortunately, we've not had to contend with too much in, in the way of adverse weather, other than, of course, being at anchor. And the amount of strain that we've put on the rigging just by being in some of these rocky anchorages is a test alone of the rigging. Yeah, you're talking about the big scores and storms that came through. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yes, you're absolutely right, and in an ideal world, I would have liked to have stopped and checked everything. So we've made the decision that we would carry on. Yeah, uh, but we had no option. Well, we did. We could have turned back. No, we couldn't, because our visa was about to yes, run out. Yes, but I'm sure that if we explained what had happened, there would have been an option for us to stay. Possibly, you know? yes. I don't, yeah, and also, we, yeah, but, <laughs> absolutely, we did make the decision to continue. So anyway, so far, it, it's, it's been okay. Uh, Rusty Sailor did say, I seem to remember that you had a full rigging check about three years ago. Any thoughts on that? And that's a good point. But a rigging check is, well, it's obviously for uh, safety concerns, but it's also for the insurance. 
and the rigging check only looks at the cables. Are you sure? Yep, the rigging check does not look at your through hull, through bolt, through deck fittings, your bolts and what have you, your chain plates. Right, didn't know that. So, which is kind of silly really, because a rigging check should look at everything. Of course, because it could all be fine above, but below it could be all decaying. That doesn't make sense at all. Absolutely, yeah. All right, so, but we have made the decision that we're going to continue with this trip until we either go back to Sabra or, or stop somewhere. And wherever we stop, it'll be somewhere where we haul out. And on that list now is to check every single chain plate and through hole fitting. Yep. It's got a big job, but it's got to be done, clearly. Yep. Uh, we don't want this to happen again. So, we, yeah, so continuing, but carefully. Correct. But I have to say the repair that we got done under the circumstances was exceptional. Mm. Thanks to, what were they called? ST Stainless Steel Works in Sabah, uh, sorry, in Sandakan. And uh, it was great having Ian there as well, who was able to you know, keep an eye on things and check that uh, they, they did the job. Yeah, so correctly. Ian is, is on one of the other boats that we're sailing with, isn't it? He's on a steel boat. So yes. he really knows about welding. He does. <laughs> he, he's done a lot of welding, so he knows what he's talking about. But uh, yeah, they did a great job and they turned it around immediately. So uh, yeah. just, just marvellous. And, um, you know, that was, a, 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 despite the circumstances, it was actually a fun morning. And I think I said, even said to camera, it reminded me of when we very first started sailing and how quickly we learned how part of cruising is about uh, fixing the boat in strange places, yeah. uh, perhaps with language barriers, with no local knowledge at all. And part of the fun is going out to try and find those people that can help you. And uh, it, it's, yeah, it's one of the fun things. And Robert Kalowski said, honestly, I find searching out repairs and food to be the most fun part of a journey, especially where I can't speak a word of their language. Hell, I might be a closeted mime given some thought. And no, no, that's absolutely right. How funny, because I uh, picked that one out as well. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was great. And you know, it's really true, isn't it? That um, searching around villages and towns and getting to know them in cir circumstances like that, you really get to know it. And obviously we do a lot of food shopping, so we, get, we do that everywhere we go. Yeah, I mean, he, at the end of it, he said, there is something in that moment when a woman realizes you're in need and her mothering instincts kick in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, humanity, ain't it great? And it did just make me think of Grace, who we've just been uh, staying with and diving with over at Derawan. Mm. You know, she did have that very sort of motherly instinct. And mm. obviously she's in, tour she's in the tourism industry, so it's in her interest to look after her. But in her company, you felt very well looked after, didn't you? Yeah, we'll introduce Grace in a, in a future episode to everyone. Mm. But yeah, we, there's a Grace everywhere we go, really. There really yeah. is, yeah. And there's also a Harry. There are plenty of men that help as well. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so that was episode 294. Was there anything else you wanted to mention on that episode? Uh, no, I, th I think uh, it was pretty much on that sole subject, so uh, we could do it to death. So Yes, so that was great. Um, glad that's over. That was a f just a few weeks ago. Um, we've been okay, touch wood, since then. And you've checked it recently and it's all looking okay, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it looks fine. Okay. So before we go on to anything else, I just want to pick up on a few points about last week's podcast, 009. We touched on lots of different uh, subjects, but one of the ones that people really got lit up about was strobes versus anchor lights, where you put them, what they should look like. Uh, a lot of people had something to say on the subject, but just going to read this one out. Doug Tiffany. Having sailed and worked in Southeast Asia for 20 years as an oil field diver and sailing my own boat between jobs back in the 70s and 80s, watching YouTube brings back many wonderful memories. In regard to anchoring lights, back in the olden days, one hung a kerosene light in the fore triangle about six feet above the deck. When he says one, I guess that's him. I suppose that's what everybody did. Don't know where or when the location ended up on top of the mast for an electric light, but I believe it is dangerous, as at night one is looking at eye level, not up at an angle, and looking up while moving through the water quite quickly, which seems to be what most people want to do these days, isn't safe. I hang a Fresnel lens with an LED on my foredeck, and in regard to other lights, i.e. strobes, etc., the more the better. All for now, Doug. <laughs> so. 
I think he kind of sums up where we were coming from and also what a lot of other people had to say on the matter. Did you, um, do you know what a Fresnel is? No. Right. Did you to, look it up? Yeah, I had to look it up. So a Fresnel lantern pronounced Fresnel or Frunel is a common lantern used in theatre which employs a Fresnel, Fresnel, Frunel lens to wash light over an area of the stage. The lens produces a wider, soft-edged beam of light which is commonly used for backlight and top light. Sounds so, romantic. So it's a diffused, Sounds like spread it, out yeah. light. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, to be honest, we could do one of those right now in this cockpit, we couldn't really we? Could, yes. <laughs> so yeah, so that was. I mean, don't want to say lots more about it because we said pretty much what we what we thought at the time. Were there any other comments that came up that you need you feel the need to respond to now? Not really. No, but uh, I would be interested to know at what point in the cruising history did we decide to put an anchor light right on top of the mast? Yeah. My theory is that it's part of the whole tricolour set up. Yes. By the way, we say tricolor. <laughs> tr most people say tricolor. I, I, I say tricolor. And the tricolor uh, system is normally, it's two bulbs, but it's one unit. And I just wonder if it has something to do with the ease of maintenance and the convenience of being able to just uh, access one unit. And I don't know if that is why we have yes. the anchor light at the very top of the mast. Of course, being at the top of mast means it can be seen from further, yes. but Doug is absolutely right. And we said it before that when you approach an anchorage, you are looking on the horizon. You're not looking up. Yeah. So well, in fact, when you're in the, an the anchorage, you're even less likely to look up, aren't you? So if you're dodging between boats or coming from shore to your boat, you really ain't looking, as he said later, at a 45 degree angle. You haven't got your head looking up at the sky. Mm. So I, if anyone out there knows when we started putting anchor lights right at the top of the mast, I'd love to know, and more importantly, why we do it. Yeah. Because I think an anchor light above the deck makes more sense because uh, A, it's lower down, and B, it potentially lights up the rest of the boat as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, what but, I'd like to know is, because we haven't been back to the Med or over to America or anywhere like that for many, many years, have they started using those lights yet? The strobe lights? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, like we do in South East, because it's common here. Everybody does it. So I'm just interested to know well, it, if it's it, happened elsewhere. But it's, it goes against the coal regs. Yeah. You know, I think a flashing yellow light is a boat in displacement mode, if I remember rightly. Right. Um, I think that means hovercraft. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm a bit rusty on the coal regs. So flashing lights do go against the coal regs. But the coal regs are just, they're not actually the law, are they? Well, they are if your insurance company oh, gets okay. involved. Yes. Yeah. And... Um, the, the other thing I was thinking was, of course, flashing LED technology is relatively recent compared to the coal regs. If we had had flashing LED technology when they wrote the coal regs, maybe perhaps they would have incorporated f a flashing light, maybe of a particular colour or a frequency, as being an, an, an anchor light. So that, that was something that I was thinking about because I'm not sure how old the coal regs are, mm. but they certainly would have been written well before, mm. uh, the advice on anchor lights would have been written well before we had all this new lighting technology. Do their coal regs get updated? Another question to be answered. Yeah, again, I don't know that. I don't, they I must don't know do, that. mustn't they? Because uh, vessels well, are changing all the time. But Yeah, but the, don't forget, these are a set of guidelines, rules and regulations that shouldn't change. Because if you keep changing them, then people are going to get confused. I suppose so. it's a bit like driving, isn't it? And yeah. the rules of the road, it, it should remain the same. Consistent. Yeah. yeah. OK. Yeah. OK, lots of questions there, actually. Maybe our listeners can answer some of those. I don't want to just Google it. I'd like to know what people think. All right, so we'll leave that, that particular topic now, shall we? Apart from one more comment, which is from Don Richards, who says, anchor ball is the most often neglected item. Insurance companies love using that excuse to reduce liabilities. To which you answered, good one. We have both the ball and the motor sailing cone. My question to you is, how long ago did we use either of those? I don't want to admit that <laughs> on camera. No, I know. I mean, the, the sailing, we haven't used that sailing mo motor cone for a long time. We, when we first started in Turkey, we were using them all, all the time. All the time. Yeah. And, and I think also perhaps where you've got more boats at anchor, maybe we felt more inclined to raise the anchor ball. Yeah. 
uh, whereas we don't do it so much nowadays because there are very few boats around. But even so, that shouldn't be an excuse. But you've got to ask yourself, how many local fishing boats here, and you can hear one buzzing past us now, know what an anchor ball is? Well, it's not just them, it's other people. Do you remember when we were here over in Southeast Asia and we were you know, religiously using our anchor ball? and some friends from Australia said, what's that thing you keep putting up? They had no idea. Sorry for interrupting, but while I've got you here, if you like what we do and you want to support us and become a Patreon, or join us on FTB Mates, or even drop a quid in the rum fund, go to followtheboat.com forward slash pub. Of course, come to the pub. I think in last week's podcast, didn't I say how nice it was to hear from new sailors? Yes. And uh, and I suspect this, I would like this to be a running theme. Okay. I'd, I'd love to hear from more new sailors. And we got a great one from Pedro Redondo uh, of Sailing Tulip. And he said, great topics you have covered on this podcast. I can consider myself to be a new sailor. Got my boat one year ago, but since September has been on the hard. Mid-April the season, she will start again and she's going into her element again. It is a long dream come true. This was something I wanted for more than 20 years. And finally, I was able to get her. It's, a, it's an old lady, but I have been taking good care of her, especially during the last few months where I did some much needed jobs. I believe she's in better condition now and I'm really looking forward to sail again here on the Dutch waters. And this last bit is the bit that I particularly like. So during the last season, I learned so many things. And like everything else, every day is different and you will always learn something new. So hopefully this season will be no different and I will enjoy her very much and learn even more things. I think Pedro hits the nail on the head there with cruising generally and especially when you start out. There is so much stuff to learn. Isn't it's, there? Yes, it's really great to hear him say that as a new sailor, that he understands that right from the beginning. It's something we try to say all the time. And I'm, I'm thrilled, I'm thrilled. Yeah, so we want to do a shout out to people who are doing this. I mean, well, and, and also, yeah, and I'd like, uh, I'd love to know. I mean, pick, just going back to Pedro's point about learning new things, mm. you know, I'd love to learn what are these new skills that people are picking up that mm. uh, they're getting something out of. I mean, I always found navigation endlessly fascinating. Having had some experience of using maps as a Cub Scout, uh, to then transfer those basic skills to a much more complicated navigation. Yes. Um, it, it was, it's something I continue to enjoy. Yes. Uh, and it's a skill that, you know, perhaps you didn't use as much on land, but at sea, when you're cruising around, you're using it all the time, every day. Yes, it's, it's extraordinary how many things that you've learned over the years suddenly become useful. It's very true. Mm. OK, so that's great. So we want to hear from more people who are starting out on this journey, what they're expecting from it and what, what they've learned so far. Well, Daryl Foster, uh, sorry, Forster, sorry, Daryl, he says, Hi, Liz and Jamie, love everything. Talk about a new start. I turn 72 tomorrow, and happy birthday oh, to you, Daryl. And just bought a boat after a 30-year break due to life necessities. And he goes on to mention a few heart attacks he's had along the way. Um, so again, you know, we've got someone who's just getting back into it after a 30-year break, and it's, it's great to hear, especially from someone, you know, who's a little bit older than the perhaps the average cruiser. Yes. OK, so no matter what your age, let us know if you're about to embark on an adventure like this mm. or even if you're just buying a boat or something about your history. It would be very interesting to share it with everybody else. Um, that brings me on to William Bunting, who sent in a comment saying, a while ago I realised that I'd forgotten how to jump. <laughs> <laughs> Jumping into water, no problem. Jumping from the deck down to the dock, Long gone. I'm with you there, uh, William. I'm a lot older than you guys at 71. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering if Jamie still springs around leaping over things. Recognising I've got a problem, I now periodically jump down the steps in the passageway from the galley down to the saloon. I just have to tone up my muscles and reactions, reminding my brain what it feels like to land hard on both feet. This summer I'm going to try to work it up to where I can leap from the aft deck to the pier. So I think that, that covers a couple of things. So he, he again, you know, he's, he's, he's 71, getting on, but he's looking after his health and he's trying to get better at it. I've got to say, in the last couple of years or so, I felt my joints getting more 
tired mm. and jumping isn't the thing it used to be when I was a kid. I'd jump up and down all over the place and never had to worry. Now I have to think twice before I make that jump, work out which leg's going to land first and all that sort of thing. But I think he's got a really good point. I don't do enough practicing of jumping. Well, you tried it the other day, much to my amusement, when we went for a walk around the island and there was a big palm tree that had fallen over and the tide was coming in and we had to get over that. And yeah. I think we both struggled a bit with that. Yeah. <laughs> but, well, I think I, was, I, was, I had things in both hands and I couldn't yeah. find anywhere to, you know, to sort of leave myself up over it. If I'd thought about it, I should have gone a bit further into the water and where it would, where it would have been yeah. lower. But yeah, so the other one was having to jump from a rock onto the sand and mm. there was a lot of water, you know, the tide was coming in and going out and I wanted to jump as the water went out. So I took that leap of faith. It was okay, and that was just sand. But generally, jumping, what a good point, yeah. I mean, on the boat, we tend not to jump no. around. We try to minimise movement, uh, which sounds really lazy, doesn't it? But by that, I mean, we don't run around the boat. Never. You want to do careful, considered mo uh, movement, don't you? Yeah. So, I mean, as we all know, you have uh, one hand for you, one hand for the boat, and obviously both feet, ideally, on the deck somewhere. Mm. And um, I think as you get to know your boat more and more, you, uh, you get a feel for where you can move and how you can move around the boat. Yeah. And um, that just comes with nature, I think. So I think his point is a good one, um, keep fit, get used to doing things. But I wanted also to bring up the, the age thing. So we've had a couple of correspondents now, both in their 70s. And just to remind everybody that we did uh, an episode called Are You Too Old To Sail? It came out a couple of years ago and it had a really good response. People have really enjoyed it and the commentary below that uh, from people who've watched it is amazing. There are some incredible stories that people have uh, sh shared with us. So do have a look for Are You Too Old To Sail? Definitely worth a watch. I'll put uh, a link to it in the description on the video and in the podcast. So, in fact, no, you're never too old to sail, in my opinion. Well, and I think these people have just commented have proved that. Yeah. We pe we've met people in the 90s who are still cruising. Mm. Just shows you, doesn't it? Mm. It's an attitude of mind. Okay, so that, that's, the, that, that's age for you. Actually, William sent a great long comment and, uh, under the last week's podcast, 009, and uh, this is the second thing he, he wrote that I really was quite interested in. An important factor in what you do is the PR value of your adventures and global exposure. I well remember the little Indonesian village you called in on years ago where you said you were the first yacht these locals had ever seen. Walking around that village, showing how the community worked, changed my perceptions of Indonesian life. And I think about that quite often. In other words, you both are great ambassadors for the places you visit. So before we comment on that, that was a place called Ayaputi in the Anambas Islands, which are very seldom visited by anybody. And the particular uh, episode was called First Sailboat Ever to Come Here. So look for that again, I'll link in the description. So I really like that comment because I do regard us as ambassadors in some ways, don't you, for these more out of the way places? Yes, I, my pause and reservation there is, it, it can sound a bit arrogant mm. that we are these new uh, world explorers who have discovered <laughs> these new places and that isn't the case and I, I think on the one hand, yes, we represent all people foreign to the local people. Mm. And in that respect, yes, we, we have to be ambassadors. Well, we? that's being ambassadors for, for, for our side of the world. Mm. So, yes, I mean, that is true. That's a, that's a different though. He's saying we're ambassadors for Indonesia. And uh, yes, of course, we can't be because we're not Indonesian. Right, I understand. But, yes. I understand that. So, okay. you, you say you'd misunderstood. So... Although we're not ambassadors for Indonesia, I think what we're doing is shining a light on the cultures and the places and the people that we meet by having this YouTube channel. Yeah, this is true. I mean, there are plenty of other YouTubers out there, not just sailing, but, uh, you know, we are not the first people to do this. Uh, I'm just playing this down, and, and I, I do appreciate that comment that, of course, to a lot of people... Uh, who are seeing these places for the first time through our own videos. 
uh, then it's great that we are opening their eyes. To and that's all we can do, isn't it? Yeah. All we can do is show them through our own videos. And obviously there's loads of information out there, so if you want to go and read it, watch it, you can. But I think people who know us and who've been following us, they now see what we see when we go to these places. I personally think it, it is important um, and that we are doing good work. Because when I look at other sailing channels, there are not many in this area. Now, we know there are lots of cruisers here. We know that we have plenty of friends and we've met lots of people who cruise around here. But very few that have sailing channels that really dedicate themselves to Southeast Asia in the way that we have. And his is not, Williams is not the first comment to say, oh, you've opened my eyes, I didn't know you could do it. Oh, I didn't know. So now this is on my on my list of places to see, which which fills me with joy, actually. Yes, and it's one of the reasons why we always say we're not just a sailing channel. Mm. You know, if you just want pure sailing, there are plenty of good mm. YouTubers out there that yep. just do pure sailing. And we have never been about that. And it is because, for these reasons, that we love going ashore. And we ourselves are discovering these places course, for, the, for yeah. the first time. And, you know, I, and I think we do it honestly. We don't sugarcoat it. Mm. it is, what you see is what we see. Mm. And if we can entertain, inform, maybe educate any of those viewers and get them to see and experience those same things that we are seeing and experiencing, yeah. then that is one of the joys of what we do. Yeah, it's just seeing things from a different perspective because the, what, what do I know about South America? I know nothing apart from what I've read and I see on the news. And I know that what I read and see on the news about Southeast Asia bears no resemblance to what I actually experience here. So I think it's really important to get into the nitty gritty to talk to people or, or watch what people are doing who are actually there. Now, Indonesia is a Muslim country. It's got an enormous population. I can't remember, 180 million? But no, it's more than that. I think it's, it's, two, it's over 200. And it is the most uh, populous Muslim country in the world. Yes. And of course, we all know that Islam gets um, a pretty bad rep a lot of the time. And what we've found really from India, well, from Turkey onwards, mm. for the whole time we've been sailing, we've been predominantly in is Islamic countries, and we have found nothing but welcome and happiness. It's quite different to what we read in the papers. So, uh, yeah, Indonesia is not a terrifying country, no more terrifying than any other country. Mm. It has its good and it's had its bad, but predominantly good, I'd say. But that's the true everywhere. It is. Uh, what we've experienced so far on this little trip has been <laughs> nothing but positive. Oh, no. Thanks very much for William for that and for other people who have also said a similar thing. Uh, we will continue to shine a light on the places that we see and hopefully give people a more realistic idea of what it's really like to live in these places. Going on a little bit from <laughs> age-related questions, this one's more about, about medication. Um, and I should think that in pretty much every video we do, there is some comment about hospitals, doctors, medication and whatever. It's a big thing on people's minds of all ages and backgrounds. So Jerome Herbert says, I'm just curious if you take any maintenance meds. I don't care what kind of or for what. But if you do, how do you get your scripts filled? Where do you get them filled? And how do you get them sent to you? Right, so I'll uh, put a heads up, I take a daily dose of thyroxine because I have an underactive thyroid, it's a very common thing, but I am required to take a certain amount every day. And it was a concern of mine when we first left the UK because I had a prescription for this and had to have it tested every year or so. So I was wondering what to do. Initially, when I was in the UK, I'd get six months worth and then I'd pop back and see mum and dad and I'd pick up another six months worth and that's how it worked. But as we got further away and my journeys back to the UK became more difficult and uh, the time between kept getting longer, I had to start getting them filled in the countries where we were. And you know what? Every country has doctors and every country has hospitals and testing facilities and pharmacies and I have found no problem in getting my medication. Yeah, you've been, I wouldn't say lucky, because it is freely available. Occasionally you have to hunt around a bit, don't you? You might have to jump between doctors and hospitals, but pretty much in every country we've been in so far, you've not had a problem. And of course, the other thing is, is that you've been able to get three months worth or six months worth of medication 
if you know you're going to be offshore for quite some time. That's right. I just checked the uh, sell-by dates or the use-by dates to make sure they're OK. Um, it does vary from country to country, so I never know until I get there whether I have to get a doctor's prescription or not. In Malaysia, I didn't. I could just buy it over the counter. Uh, in other countries, I've had to go to a doctor to get a prescription for it. They just look at the old prescription and they say, oh, yes, and I, I know what I'm talking about, and they just usually just write the prescription straight out for me. Sometimes I've had a test. And I guess that's going to be the same for everything, you know, for beta blockers or whatever it is you're taking. Certainly over here in Southeast Asia, there's a lot of things you can buy over the counter that you certainly cannot in Europe and in North it's, 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 it's amazing what you can yeah. buy over the counter. I mean, things like uh, antibiotics yeah. uh, are things that we like to carry on board in case of emergencies. And buying antibiotics over the counter can be problematic. It uh, was in Thailand. Yes, in Thailand they really didn't like... No. You'd have to fight your corner to explain, look, we are cruisers, we're going to be offshore, we, we need these because we can't just go and buy them as and when we need them. Uh, whereas in Malaysia, it was a lot easier, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Uh, you know, they're a little bit more circumspect these days with antibiotics, as we all know, because there's a problem in that uh, they're not working as well. But yeah, you can pretty much get everything. And usually you're not too far from land. And so if you've got a problem, you get into the nearest, even just a village, they usually, I mean, even in Anambas, in those tiny little islands, there were, there were places where we could get things, weren't there? Yes, and do you remember we uh, met the flying doctor, was he called? Yes. In the Mentawi Islands yes. off Sumatra. Tiny islands off Western Sumatra. Yep, and even he had, uh, admittedly actually, he was a Kiwi, wasn't he? Mm. He'd actually come over with a suitcase full of medication. Yep. but Goes over it, every year. Yeah, it does just show you that even these far-flung places mm. in these little islands, there will be someone ashore that mm. uh, can normally help out in case of medical emergency. Yeah, I mean, just think about it. These people in these countries, in every country, we all get the same diseases and mm. we all get the same medication. So, yeah, you should be fine. I wouldn't, I wouldn't make it a, a worry. It's, it's dealable. Um, so the only other thing I wanted to bring up was something <laughs> that comes up occasionally, and that is pets. Everybody who knows us knows we had a pet. We had Millie on board for a long time. We don't talk about her very often because it still really hurts that she's no longer with us. But I just wanted to bring up this one, which, you know, sort of nothing to do with anything. But this is typical of what we get. So, Mr. QVFAGWVABABAHHSJW. <laughs> That's the handle of that person. I said, Mr., it could be Mrs. or Ms. Um, who says, are there any videos or podcasts where you talk about the difficulties of sailing with a cat or cats? We know it's been nearly two years since the passing of your furry, beloved Millie, it has. We miss her too, thank you. In the next 18 months, we plan on getting an older sailboat and I have multiple cats, three over 12 years, and would like some insight. Stay strong, stay strong and sail on. Um, do you want to say anything about that? <laughs> before I do? Well, I think with animals, the most important thing is their concern and interest. Nail on the head. It's exactly what I said in my reply. This also applies to your partner, your husband, yes. your wife, your children. Just because you want to go off and live on a boat, do, does your family, do your pets, yeah. is it a good idea to grab your 10, 12 year old cat or dog who's been happily living on land and stick them on a boat. And, and that's, you've got to be honest about that. That's the, the most primary thing yes. is to think about that. First. I mean, we did do a video calling Sailing with Cats and Dogs, What You Must Know. So have a look for that. I'll put it in the description. That was four years ago. But I think what we said is, is still relevant. There are definitely families we've met where one of the children doesn't want to be there. We've certainly met partners mm -hmm. where one of the partner doesn't want to be there. Yep. And we know that certain dogs and cats on certain boats have not wanted to be there and have made it very obvious to the owners that they didn't want to be there. In fact, some of them have had to let the cat go because it just kept jumping off the whole time everywhere they went. I mean, much better that someone... Uh, 
pet owner does that, I think yeah. you, you've got to be true to yourself and say, OK, the pet is clearly not enjoying this. If I want to carry on sailing, the best thing is to rehouse that animal. That's what I'd say. I'd, I'd say that um, cats and dogs, as long as they're happy, it doesn't matter if they're not with you, it might kill you inside a bit. But if you know that they're happy and they're not in any danger, because danger is all around you when you have an animal on the boat, you're constantly worried they're going to fall off, particularly on journeys. And there's lots of things you can do to prevent that. I'm not going to go through all that now. But it is a worry the whole time that when you go on land, you're going to lose them, that people are going to steal them. It is a constant worry having a pet. We wouldn't do it again. It's not something that we would advise. Yeah, I, I would also say as, a, as an animal lover, uh, if I had pets, I wouldn't even be thinking about setting mm. off cruising. Mm. I would wait until they pass yeah. away. This is something that we've learned through experience. Mm. So we, we might have been different about it before. Although before we got Millie, you kept saying, we're not going to have an animal. You were mm. quite right about that. She adopted us as a very small kitten and would have been killed had we not... Well, there, there's the other thing. I mean, you know, we've had we had her from literally two, three months yeah. old. So all she ever knew was the boat. And I think that's the point I'm trying to make. If your pet has been happily pampered at home with a routine, maybe stays indoors when you go off to work and then you, they get taken out for walks in the park after after work. Or a cat with a cat flap that's free to go in and out whenever it likes. Yes. And, and to suddenly change that routine when they are elderly pets is, I don't think that's fair on them. It's Having difficult. said that, we do know people who have taken their elderly yes. cats on board and the cat has adapted to it. So it's not that it, it can't be done. Yeah. But, yeah, you've just, you've got to know your pet and you've got to know whether you think they can handle that change. And then if they can't handle that change, be brutally honest with yourself and say right I need to rehouse this cat yeah. or dog or I'm not going to go out cruising until they've passed away. Yeah it's a really tough one isn't it because mm. as animal lovers ourselves we know exactly how you feel Mr. I'm not going to say it all over again but uh, it is a difficult one. Um, yeah right ending on that what are you going to do later today? Well, we have just seen two of the boats that we're with go past and they're actually venturing further up into the atoll. Now, according to the charts, this is all basically drying land. But we've got 20 metres under the hill. One of them has already been...